All right, welcome back. This will be take four. Um, I was trying to open my links to my YouTubes uh, within the video and explain what was going on, but that's not going to work out. So you will have to uh, go to those YouTube videos and look at them uh, yourself in detail, and I really, really encourage you to do so. All right, so let me decrease or get off here. And we'll go to my video. Actually, my PowerPoint. And let's see. I don't want to slideshow. inflammatory disorders. So let's try this one more time. So if you'll get your peace book out so you can follow along with me, uh, I'm going to start out on page 785. 785. I feel like I've got this memorized on doing it four times. All right. Acute appendicitis. This is inflammation of the appendix, which is a blind pouch at the end of the cecum. It's the most common cause of abdominal pain in children. Would anyone like to guess why? Well, if you guessed, because we don't have a definite test to diagnose appendicitis, you are absolutely correct. Uh, because we have to do tests to rule out other things, we end up doing surgery in the form of exploratory lab. Now, what's bad about that is sometimes we open the abdomen and find that the appendix is absolutely normal. At that point, they would just still go ahead and take it out so they wouldn't give them trouble later on. But it is also... Uh, the way to find out if we have a hot appendix that's about to rupture or even a ruptured appendix. If you look there, the greatest incidence occurs between 10 and 19 years of age, mainly in boys. Appendicitis really occurs in infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. And that's really a good thing because uh, infants can't tell you where they're hurting. And toddlers can't uh, explain pain well as, uh, as well either. So if the greatest uh, incidence between 10 and 19, with 10 being the average age, if you think about what's going on with this age group, you should be considering growth and development concepts. And some things that should be popping into your mind is body image, self-concept at this age. So things like scars, abdominal scars, do make a difference at this age. So just keep that in the back of your mind. The patho appendicitis usually results from an obstruction of the appendix. <laughs> appendix and it can be by fecal material or foreign body. Now what do I mean by foreign body? They have found hairballs, fingernails, parasites in the form of pinworms and other microorganisms that have obstructed the lumen. It doesn't matter what it is, once the lumen is obstructed, inflammation and edema develop. That's going to lead to compression of the blood vessels. That's going to shut off the nutrients to the appendix cells then necrosis and pain is going to result, and if not discovered, the necrotic area will actually rupture. And if you think about it, whatever is obstructing that, which most of the time it is fecal matter, is going to go into the abdomen and cause peritonitis. Just a quick research note. Uh, it has been proven um, with higher incidence in those who have low dietary fiber. But this is very important, the small window period of time prior to rupture. It's only 36 hours after the abdominal pain begins. And if you think about it, 36 hours can pass very quickly and easily. In fact, within 48 hours, the appendix will have proliferated in 80% of children. So it's one of those things you want to catch as soon as you can. Diagnosis is based upon clinical manifestations. Uh, fever, vomiting, abdominal pain um, are some common things that you will see. If you look at the box on page 785, box 4-5, the first thing listed there is right lower quadrant abdominal pain. Now with appendicitis, it does not start out being right lower quadrant abdominal pain. It actually starts out being diffuse abdominal pain. In other words, it's all over general abdominal pain. Then as it progresses, it will localize in the right lower quadrant. McBurney's point is one of the most common points halfway between the anterior superior iliac crest and the umbilicus. And that's discussed on page 785 in detail. 
Uh, rebound tenderness is common, and we'll talk about what that means here in just a little bit. Uh, that's when you put in, put pressure down on uh, the right lower quadrant and as you let up it hurts because it causes a jarring sensation to the organ. And the heel drop jarring test and that's just what it means. Stay on your hip, hip tip toes, drop one uh, to your heels and that jarring sensation will cause a pain to the uh, appendix. Uh, elevated white blood count, shift to the left. If you'll remember, that means too many immature white blood cells, bands, or stabs that occur with an overwhelming acute infection. Look for a count 15,000 or greater. Abdominal x-rays, um, sonograms, CTs to rule out the possible obstruction or possibly reveal a hard and fecal uh, material. Uh, also keep that in mind. Keep in mind you want to assess the area of pain less. So if they're complaining of uh, last, if they're complaining of left lower quadrant pain, you would want to assess that area uh, last. Other clinical manifestations listed on box 24-5 again is fever, rigid abdomen, decreased or absent bowel sounds, vomiting, typically followed by the onset of pain, constipation or diarrhea, so changes in bowel habit tachycardia, slow rapid breathing, pallor, lethargy, irritability, and stewed posture in the form of guarding. So how do we elicit these signs? A rebound tenderness, again, uh, is when you push in on the right lower quadrant, you let up and it causes jarring of the organs. The Rothfuss sign is applying pressure to the left lower quadrant and that when you let up it still elicits referred pain to the right lower quadrant. Now, rebound tenderness is, itself is not specific to appendicitis. It simply means that the presence of peritoneal irritation is present. But it is two signs that we can use to help uh, differentiate if we think it's appendicitis or not. On your own, unfortunately, you'll have to look at this YouTube videos because when I try to access them, it will not uh, let me within this actual PowerPoint. That's what was causing me so much trouble. So I want to encourage you all to do that because it explains these. Uh, it shows you McBurney's point and it explains Roth's sign in detail. Nursing alert, nursing alert, nursing alert. Number one, signs of peritonitis in addition to fever include sudden relief from pain after perforation with a subsequent increase in pain. Progressive abdominal distension, tachycardia, rapid shallow breathing, pallor, chills, and irritability. So in other words, you've got a child you've been taking care of who's complained of diffuse abdominal pain that uh, localized to the right lower quadrant, sets up in the bed, all of a sudden it says, oh, I feel so much better, the pain's gone. That's not a good thing. Probably has had sudden relief uh, from pain because of uh, perforation. Now, number two, in any instance when appendicitis is expected, be aware of the dangers of administering laxatives, enemas, or applying heat. That means someone did that. Increases the risk of perforation because it stimulates bowel motility. Uh, ice is okay, but watch the dangers of laxatives, enemas, and heat. Treatment. Surgical removal of the appendix in the form of an appendectomy. Fluid and electrolyte corrections. Now, if it's an unruptured appendix, then usually your post-op course is uneventful. They'll usually go home within a few hours after surgery and often uh, discharged uh, within uh, the same day or the next day. Uh, often now we're doing laparoscopics as well, so 24 to 48 hours if all goes well. Now, it's, if the appendix happens to be ruptured, though, the pre- and post-op management is different. Uh, we're going to have IV fluids, correcting electrolyte imbalance. We're going to be given antibiotics. So when I say antibiotics, I'm talking about the big dogs, meaning ampicillin, genomycin, and cleosin. And of course, they're on genomycin. They're going to have to have peaks and troughs, okay, because it can be toxic to the kidneys. Genomycin can, and as well as cause damage to the hearing. Uh, these measures are continued post-op as well. The antibiotics are continued for 7 to 10 days. Uh, we usually get morphine for the pain, wet to dry dressings, wound irrigations, and watching for signs of infection while you're doing those dressing changes. And a long-term effect can be what we call adhesion formation. And that interferes with fertility in females and can cause bowel obstruction in both sexes later in life. So just know that is a possibility of complication later on. So nursing considerations. Severity of pains assessed carefully upon admission. Ching. And why is that? Well, because that helps diagnose 
appendicitis. Again, a typical course may look like a child's come in the ER. How was your child on Monday morning when she woke up? Well, she wasn't herself. She didn't feel good. She wasn't eating well. How was she by Monday afternoon? Well, she was complaining her stomach was kind of hurting all over. Her appetite wasn't good. Well, how was she Tuesday morning? Well, she complained of sharp pain now in that right lower quadrant. And now she's vomiting with fever, uh, diarrhea, pain. You can see how that progressed and has that typical uh, characteristic of uh, appendicitis. If surgery, pre and post op teaching, and teaching principles, which means assessing the level of knowledge, uh, using appropriate teaching based upon their best learning style. Uh, assess post-op pain and again morphine is the drug of choice. Assess uh, dehydration and correct that. No contact sports until released by the physician, usually about six weeks. And post-op positioning following a ruptured appendix is semifowlers right side line. Semifowlers right side line. Semifowlers right side line. And the reason this is important is twofold. Number one, it improves drainage. Improves drainage. And number two, prevents subdiaphragmic abscesses. Prevents subdiaphragmic abscesses. You want drainage to be in your lower pelvis, not in your lungs. All right. Any questions about that? Just please give me a call. Let's move to page 786, Meckel's diverticulum. This is the most common congenital malformation of the GI tract. It affects 1 in 3 percent of our population, more in the males. If you look at the patho, what's happening is in the embryonic life, this occurs early on, the intestines is attached to the umbilicus by a villian duct. That duct becomes a ligament as that infant reaches term. But in about 2% of all your infants, a small pouch off that ileum remains due to incomplete closure. And it can be several inches long and almost as wide, anywhere from 2 to 4 inches long and 2 to 4 inches wide. But what's going to happen in that structure, some of that displaced gastric mucosa is going to get in there. And, of course, then you get gastric acids, and then that's going to overflow into the intestines. And what's going to happen is going to irritate that bowel wall and cause ulceration and bleeding. Uh, in a few cases, it can also cause a band, a fibrous band that extends from that diverticulum, and then you're going to be talking about problems with obstruction as well. Diagnosis is usually based on a history of clinical manifestations. If you look on page 788 in your book, box 24-6, the three main things is abdominal pain, bloody stools, and then sometimes anemia and shock. If you look at the abdominal pain, it's similar to appendicitis. It can be vague. It can be recurrent. If you look at the bloody stools, one of the things that should stand out to you is as they are painless rectal bleeding. Painless rectal bleeding. Even though uh, they are having some pain similar to appendicitis, the actual bleeding is painless. It can be bright um, or dark red with mucus called current jelly-like, kind of looks like jelly uh, stools. Uh, as far as, again, they may have anemia from all the bleeding and irritation, so you want to check a CBC count. They can have a Meckel scan, which is a special nuclear scan that detects the presence of gastric mucosa. It's very sensitive and accurate in about 90% of the cases. Prognosis is good if diagnosed early for recovery. But if untreated, up to 15% mortality rate. And that's because of the complications of the GI hemorrhage and the bowel obstruction that's occurring. All right, so we've got abdominal pain, painless rectal bleeding, and can have signs of obstruction and sometimes anemia and shock with this one. So treatment is surgical removal of the diverticulum. Prognosis is good following the surgical excision. There's a really good video that shows you the removal of that. First of all, it explains the procedure, but there's a good one in here also um, if you YouTube it that shows you how they're removing that diverticulum. All right, nursing considerations is supportive. Bleeding can be traumatic. Pre- and post-op teaching, you want to monitor vital signs, particularly blood pressure, uh, bed rest, document stool characteristics pre- and post-operatively, and instructions on caring for the surgical site would be important upon discharge. All right, just a little funny, wishful thinking. A nursing assistant, a staff nurse, and a charge nurse are eating lunch in the break room. A genie appears in the break room. 
and a puff of smoke and says, I'm so pleased with the way that you cared for my Aunt Edna last week. I'm granting you all one wish apiece. Without hesitation, the nursing assistant shouts, I wish I was on a beach in Tahiti, basting in the sun. With a puff of smoke, the nursing assistant is gone. The staff nurse says eagerly, I wish I was skiing down the scopes of Switzerland and spending my nights in a cozy four-star resort. With another puff of smoke, she's gone. Now, what's your wish? The genie asks the charge nurse. Her reply, I want those two back on the unit immediately. All right, I got some good news. Inflammatory bowel disease and peptic ulcer disease are both covered in the adult content, so they will not be in the peds. But you can read over pages 789 through 793, but no test questions from that section. Hepatitis disorders, if we're not careful, we're going to be all the way through the alphabet here. Acute hepatitis is covered on page 794 through 797, but again, it's covered in the adult content, so no questions on my section. But just so you know, it is an inflammation infection of the liver caused by invasion of a virus. Hepatitis A, B, C, D, E, and G, we're up to now. Cirrhosis is on page 797-798. This is a fibrotic scarring of the liver, which represents the end stage of chronic disease in which there's generalized destruction of liver cells. Of course, cirrhosis means yellow, so that's the typical color we see, particularly in the sclera and the skin. It's rare in children and usually due to a complication from some other chronic illness that they have. Good news, this is covered in GI content. It won't be on the PEDS test. Now, biliary atresia will be on the PEDS test on page 798 where that uh, content starts. This is now called extrahepatic biliary atresia. It's the most common indication for liver transplant in pediatric patients. The congenital obstruction or absence of part of the bowel ducts causes unknown. But you have chronic obstruction of the bowel flow leading to progressive damage to the liver, leading to fibrosis, and if you're not careful, cirrhosis. When you think about the types of blockage, there's two main types, intra and extrahepatic. Intra meaning within, so it's absence of the bowel ducts within the liver. Extra meaning outside of, so absence or obstruction of the bowel passages outside the liver. So as you can imagine, there's not much we can do if you don't have bowel ducts within the liver. You have to have a complete liver transplant. So that's also known as the non-correctable type. Extrahepatic is lack of the bowel ducts outside. So that one is called correctable because we can go in and anastomose a small part of the bowel up to a uh, remnant of the bowel passage duct and create a duct for that bowel to fall into. This one uh, is also, for our fortunate, uh, is the most common type, is the extrahepatic. And since that's the correctable type, that's a good thing. Etiology is unknown. It may be involved viral infections, particularly rubella, cytomegaloviruses, and hepatitis A and B. That occur shortly before or after birth. There's no racial or genetic tendency. Female predominance, 1 in 25,000. And again, I cannot stress this part here enough. To decrease progressive liver disease, surgery has to be done within two to three months after birth. That's a key, two to three months. If they wait past that time, it's almost just too late, and there's not much we can do about it to help them. Diagnosis is based upon clinical manifestations on the next slide, which we'll look at here in just a little bit. As far as lab findings, you're going to see increased bile level, B-I-L-E, increased phosphate, increased ammonia, and prolonged prothrombin time. The reason you're seeing all those things is because of the liver damage. Jaundice, of course, is going to be an early manifestation that you're going to see. Definite diagnosis is by surgical exploration only. And again, they're not having this jaundice at birth. It's later on that you will see it. Uh, they're healthy at birth, and then later on, two to three weeks later, they start developing this jaundice that will not go away, even with treatment. Hepatomegaly will also start as well. So clinical manifestations, and these are also on a box on page 799, and I believe I'm covering all of those. So if you'll study your PowerPoints, as far as clinical manifestations and stuff, I've put the most important things in here you need to know. 
Jaundice two to three weeks after birth. And again, starts in the sclera, then you'll see it in the skin, and it just won't go away. Urine is dark and the di stains the diapers, and that's because of the excretion of bile salts and bilirubin in the urine. The stools are lighter than expected in color. That's because there's no bile pigments. Hepatomegaly and abdominal distension occur. Splenomegaly occurs. Poor fat metabolism, poor weight gain, failure to thrive, and then paritis or itching with irritability also occurs. If you think about it, they almost look like they're from one of the third world countries with the thin extremities and the large distended abdomen. When you pick them up, they get heavier and heavier and feel like almost a box of rocks is in their abdomen because of the organ of megaly. Um, okay. Treatment. The most common surgical procedure performed to establish blood flow is the Kasai procedure, in which a substitute duct is formed from a segment of the small intestine if there are any hepatic rem remnants. And for almost always, there are hepatic duct remnants that they can connect to. Now, they're going to have to open up the liver itself to actually get to uh, the remnants. And it's really a neat procedure if you... I don't have it on this YouTube video, I don't believe, but there are YouTube videos on there that you can watch. This is not a cure, but it will prolong the diseased liver and uh, until they have to have a transplant in the future. Again, I can't stress the importance that this procedure must be performed by two months of age, otherwise too much damage has occurred and it is not going to do any good. In fact, if untreated, the median age of lifespan is 19 months. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. Uh, as far as uh, looking at compli oh, I looked at the treatment. Yeah. Looking at complications, you can see here inflammation of the bile ducts, to nutritional deficits, to itching, failure to thrive, and rejection from the liver transplant itself. Management is high caloric formula containing fats that can be easily digested without bile. Um, Progestamil is very important. That's a very common one that we use. Uh, water and fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, have to be replaced. Questrin, that helps decrease the itching and improves liver function. Decrease itching and improve liver function. Aveno baths will also help with the itching. Phenobarb helps decrease the irritability. And low-salt diet and diuretics helps with the ascites. Nursing considerations is primarily supportive, referral agencies, early recognition and monitor is important, and teaching about transplant rejection signs and symptoms. All right, if you've got any questions about that, please don't hesitate to let me know. Moving on to obstructive disorders. First is HPS. Uh, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is covered on page 805 through 809 in your P's book, so you can turn to those pages. And this is a condition in which we have the circular muscle of the pyloric sphincter hypertrophies or enlarges, enlarges or thickens, and that results in an obstructive process, and the stomach will end up enlarging as well. Uh, if you look on page 808, it was a good visual on figure 24-5. You can see in figure A, you can see the string effect there where you have a small and narrowing down because of the hypertrophy of the muscle. Often you're able to feel an olive shaped mass and if you look that uh, hypertrophy muscles almost looks like an olive shaped mass. And then you can see in B where they went down and actually slit that muscle so that it opens that back up and releases that obstruction. The incidence is high, usually 1 in 500 males, 1 in 1,000 females, and it's more common in Caucasians. Now, the genetics, the etiology, the verdict's out, but it has been my experience with children that, uh, for the most part, if I start asking questions, I will find that there was someone in the family who also suffered from HPS. Diagnosis, clinical manifestations, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, ultrasound shows the hypertrophied valve. Uh, the upper GI series will show the string effect. Some research is linked to erythromycin use to pyloric stenosis. In order for them to have pyloric stenosis, a thickened pylorus, and you ought to know this for test purposes, of greater than 4 millimeters in diameter with a length of greater than 18 millimeters 
for the pyloric channel would be diagnosis for pyloric stenosis. So the clinical manifestations, projectile vomiting three to four feet. This is usually about 30 minutes after they eat. So they become hungry to avid nursers. They eat, throw up, eat, throw up. There's no evidence of pain or discomfort. I'm not sure how they come up with that. Weight loss with signs of dehydration, distended upper abdomen, and again that palpable olive tumor we were talking about, and visible peristaltic waves. And I've got a good YouTube there again that you can go to later and look at very neat peristaltic waves. Treatment is surgical correction, and that's the standard treatment. Uh, the muscle of the pylorus is actually split, and that allows for a larger lumen. And the procedure does sound easy, but it's really technically difficult to perform because there's a high risk of infection afterward because it's near the diaper area. So they're going to make a slit under the uh, umbilicus, uh, between the umbilicus and the upper um, pubis area, about midway between. And when they make that slit below the umbilicus, they pull the stomach out and lay it on the stomach. Then they will see the hypertrophied muscle, and they'll actually go in and slit that muscle slowly and slowly and slowly until they release that pressure. There is a good YouTube video. I didn't put the link on here that you can watch that's very neat. Uh, discharge, if they do have new laparoscopic procedures now, so they have a shorter surgical time quicker feeding, feeding these a lot quicker after surgery, and they're actually some, uh, going home uh, about 24 hours later now with the laparoscopic. Preoperatively, of course, you want to restore hydration and electrolytes, metabolic alkalosis particularly because of all the vomiting. Mantra vital signs, oral care, I know, uh, IVs, head a bit up. And if they got an NG tube, of course, they'll be NPO because that's de helping de decompress the stomach. One of the things that is super important postoperatively, and really you should be doing this preoperatively, is teaching that some vomiting for the first 24 hours is normal. Now, they may or may not have the NG. If they have the NG, that's not a big issue. But you want to make sure they know that because they've had a child who's come in with vomiting, projectile vomiting, three to four feet every 30 minutes or so after they eat. And here they come back from surgery having that corrected and they're vomiting again. So they may think that something's not going right. Eye, nose, eye, bees, uh, nether positioning, semi-fowlers on their right side, semi-fowlers right side. And this just allows for the normal flow of contents, the normal flow of stomach contents. You want to assess bowel function, start a diet within 24 hours. You're going to be holding that baby up during feeding, feeding them very slowly and burping them frequently and usually recovery is good. Alright, intussusception is covered on page 809. This is an evagnation or telescoping of one portion of the intestine into another. One of the most frequent causes of intestinal obstruction during infancy. Etiology is unknown. We think it's related to viruses, uh, particularly gastroenteritis. The most common site is at the ileocecal valve and it shows you a good picture of that on page 809. This is always considered a medical emergency. The peak age is three to nine months. If you were to think about a glove in the hospital and you blew into the glove and all the fingers popped out and you were to take one of those fingers and stick it back up into the glove, that would be the same concept as intussusception. It's based upon clinical manifestations. There's supposed to be a classic uh, triad of symptoms that you see. And they are a colicky abdominal pain, number one, and this child screaming intermittently with their knees drawn up. Screaming intermittently with knees drawn up. Current jelly-like stools, we talked about that earlier with Meagles diverticulum. But if you'll remember, with Meagles diverticulum, it was painless. Now with these children, they usually have pain. And then a palpable abdominal mass in the right uh, lower quadrant. Um, And I think that may be upper right quadrant. I need to check that. But it's going to be sausage-shaped mass. And uh, instead of an olive shape, it's going to be a sausage-shaped mass. Definite diagnosis is um, made by a barium enema. And actually, most people use a water contrast enema now. Uh, and yes, it does say a palpable sausage mass in the upper right quadrant. Sorry, upper right quadrant. 
on page 18 in your box. So that is an upper right quadrant. It also talks on there, uh, other signs and symptoms, the empty uh, lower right quadrant, which is known as the dance sign. So if they're right lower quadrant, it's going to be the dance sign. All right. Um, again, getting back to the enema, most of your radiologists now are using water-soluble contrast instead of barium because a lot of times there's bowel proliferation that's occurred and you wouldn't want that barium getting all into the abdomen and causing peritonitis. Now, along with that, they use air pressure. Why do you think they would use air pressure? Well, go back to the analogy I used with the balloon that you've blown, the glove that you've blown up. You've invagnated or stuck that finger back up into the glove. Now, what happens if you go back and you blow real hard again? Chances are you're going to blow that finger back right back out. Same analogy with using the barium enema or the water contrast enema with the air contrast. So very important to know. One of the things you also want to keep in your mind is passage of a normal brown stool. So they went down, they had the uh, water contrast, we'll say, with air pressure, and they come back to the room, and a few hours later they have a normal brown stool. Well, that probably means that the problem corrected itself, okay? Uh, so because now they're having stools. Uh, one of the things you need to keep in mind, though, with intussusception is that it often reoccurs. Treatment, the initial treatment or non-surgical reduction by your barium or water contrast enema with air pressure. And this is effective 75 to 85 percent of the time, so very effective. Surgical intervention involves manual reduction and invagnation and then a resection. So you hope and pray uh, that the non-surgical reduction works, otherwise on these young kids you're doing bowel resections. Nursing uh, considerations, supportive, explaining the procedure and teaching the signs and symptoms of reoccurrence. And I've got a YouTube there you can watch as well that will help explain that better. All right, anal rectal malformations are on page 18. These are common congenital developmental anomalies, usually obvious at birth. And there's a good pic on page 811 that shows you no visible external opening. Uh, it's a lack of an anal opening. Uh, it can be developmental that occurs during the first trimester. If you think about the clinical manifestations, failure to pass meconium stool. So it occurs in the first trimester. They're not passing meconium stool. So where's the meconium going? Well, often a fistula will develop. And a fistula is an abnormal connection or communication between something. And in this case, between the distal rectum and the peritoneum where the GU system occurs. So they will actually start having stool in their urine with abdominal distension being common as well. Also, upon inspection, no anal opening. If you were to go in and try to do a rectal temp, you would not be able to do one. An ultrasound will be done to reveal the level of the lesion. And the reason that's done is because there's three categories of unperforated anus. The lower, the intermediate, and the high. And I didn't put it on here because it's quite graphic, but if you go and Google repair of unperforated anus, you'll see the detailed surgery that it takes, especially a high one. With the low, the rectum has actually distended normally. It just does not have uh, the internal and external sphincters, and it just doesn't have the patent connection or the opening. So usually it just causes you to go in there and call, uh, make a slit and actually do some dilatations. With the intermittent, the rectum's at the level or below the muscle. So still there, you just have to go up and do a few more dilatations. Now with the high, the rectum ends above the muscles. There's no sphincter, so you're talking about complete um, surgery here that's very intensive. So anything from digital and endoscopic exams um, and um, as far as diagnosis and of course visual inspection is diagnostic. Treatment, again, manual dilatations, excision of the annual membrane followed by manual dilatations and then of course if it's in high one, anal rectal plastic surgery which is repair the anus in plastic surgery. Now at this time they're also going to repair the fistula. Uh, they're going to repair that opening of that fistula and actually um, the fish uh, that caught creating sphincters and enlarging the rectal opening. If it's real high one, then they will also have a colostomy. So nursing considerations is watching for the newborn who does not pass stool within the first 24 to 48 hours, doing a rectal temp to make sure they have an anal opening. 
pre and post op teaching, IV NG. As soon as the NG, uh, as soon as the bowel sounds return formula is given, and for more extensive surgery, for the higher the deficits are. Last one, like the Energizer Bunny, we keep going and going. But the last thing we're going to talk about is celiac disease on page 813. Celiac disease is also known as spruce disease. It is also known as gluten sensitive enteropathy. It's also known as CD. It is second only to cystic fibrosis as the most common cause of malabsorption in children, even though the, clot, the incidence is decreasing. And part of that is because we have so much stuff out there now that is gluten free. Uh, the basic problem here is a sensitivity response to protein, particularly the gluten factor protein found in grains. When these children eat gluten, changes occur in the intestine mucosa or villi that prevent the absorptions of food across the intestinal villi into the bloodstream. Children develop most notably an inability to absorb fats, leading to statorrhea, malnutrition, um, distended abdomen, and bulky stools. Clinical manifestations are diarrhea, growth failure, abdominal pain, vomiting, anemia, irritability, muscle wasting, edema, and fluid and electrolyte imbalances are common. There's a good discussion in your book on page 814, and it does general characteristics of impaired fat absorption, impaired nutrients, behavioral changes. Uh, definite diagnosis is made by a biopsy. Since vitamin D is one of the fat-soluble vitamins that is lacking, rickets may occur. Also, hypothrombinemia may occur because of the loss of vitamin K. So you have a deficiency of thrombin. So that's going to result in the tendency to bleed. And in adults, they're often misdiagnosed as children. They can go 10 years before they're actually fully diagnosed with this because a lot of times they get diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. Treatment, dietary low gluten diet for life, eliminating wheat, rye, barley, and oats, and substituting those grains for corn and rice. Now the way that I remember these, it's a little corny, but they can, you want to drink an RC, so they can drink an RC, rice and corn, but they shouldn't eat a brow. You wouldn't want to eat someone's brow, B-R-L-W. So you wouldn't want barley, rye, oats, and wheat. Again, you can remember it how you want to. Here's a list of foods allowed. You can see it's not like they can't have anything, but the grains are the main thing that you have to watch. Rice and corn, anything gluten-free, of course, they can have as well, including gluten-free cereals. Foods not allowed, uh, again, you would be surprised here at some of the things, but grains, anything made, of course, from our brow. And you find a lot of that in your bread, your rolls, your cookies, your uh, cakes, because a lot of the things, flowers and stuff, have gluten in it. Crackers, cereal, spaghetti, macaroni, noodles, hot dogs, pizza, luncheon meats, instant suits, beer. Of course, we shouldn't have kids drinking beer, but celiac crisis is also things that you have to watch for and making sure they know to read labels. That's very, very important. But a celiac crisis develops is when they take in a whole lot of gluten and it results in profuse watery diarrhea and vomiting. Well, that's going to lead to dehydration. Uh, and then they're going to get infection. They can get infection, so they're usually hospitalized with IV fluids, corticals, and some cortical steroids, and some other treatment. You also have to be careful for the hidden uh, gluten. Sometimes the thickening agents and some of your chocolate candy, your mayo, and your ketchup. So make sure they learn to read labels well. Celiac support groups are out there and provide education materials that will help as well. If you have any questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to let me know. Thank you very much and have a good morning, evening, afternoon, whatever it happens to be.